Father, we wanted to read that and we wanted to bring ourselves to worship because you are holy. But just as holy as you are, happier are ye. You are greater than anything we're going through. You are more good than all the bad that we've ever experienced. And you want us to turn to you in a way that allows us to connect with you and you with us. And so we're asking you to do something that we can't do. It's not anything I can say. It's not even in how we feel, but it's our faith. We pray that you would honor it and that in our desire to get fixed and our desire to be faithful and our desire to have fun, that your spirit now will minister to us through the study and through the learning of your word. That's my prayer. I hope it's our prayer. And if everyone who hears this believes the same thing, in the name of Jesus, let's all say amen. 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 Well, there it is, everybody. We are worshiping now in a way that we cannot have without making a decision to ask him to speak to us. So that was the purpose of us reading that together. And that's taken us now to our study in the book of Luke chapter 7. This is a Bible story I'm sure many of us have heard, but I hope that today we get something from it that we've never gotten before. Because it's really a story about the beauty of brokenness and how somebody who is totally torn up and, and torn down cannot just be made over, but they actually become an example to us to the point that Jesus says, if you ever want to know what it means to be loved by me, if you ever want to know what the gospel is, look at this story. And that's literally what we're about to do right now. Because when we go to the book of Luke chapter seven, you actually open up there around verse number around verse number 36, where we're entering into somebody's house. We're going to a party. This party was hosted by a Pharisee. Now, without going into a whole bunch of drama and detail, we can't think of many examples in the Gospels where the Pharisees got a thumbs up. They wouldn't get a lot of likes on their Facebook page from those who are not Pharisees because Pharisees were people who knew the law of God perfectly as a human being could. They were so close, they were so deep into the things of God that unfortunately they thought that because of what they knew, that that qualified for what they believed. And so this particular Pharisee, he actually does something that's commendable. It says in Luke chapter six, excuse me, Luke chapter seven, verse 36, one of the Pharisees desired Jesus. Now that's good right there because not many Pharisees were doing that. But what does it go on to say, everybody? He desired that Jesus would eat with him. And he, Jesus, went into the Pharisee's house and he sat down to meet. So this is a story where so far, so good. A Pharisee is inviting Jesus to his house for dinner. Verse 37 says, now in the party, there was a woman. And I'm going to ask if you would, Tar, can you read verse 37 for us? And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. So now we're being introduced to someone else at the party. And Luke 7 only calls her a woman in the city. We don't have a name yet. So without a name, we don't really have a character yet. But the only thing we have to go by at this point is her title. And now we're going to look at what the woman does. It says that this woman stood at his feet. She stood at Jesus's feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, let's just get prepositional here for a second. We kind of get a picture because we don't have a picture. But when the, it says in verse 38, she stood at Jesus's feet behind him weeping. The position that Jesus most likely was in was in a laying down position, because in order for her to be behind him at his feet, if he were sitting up, well, she couldn't really be behind his feet. She'd just be behind him. But the Bible says behind his feet. So Jesus must have been laid out. He's enjoying dinner. He's taking in the scene and he's grateful that Simon's invited him. But now she does something that nobody at the dinner does, including Simon. She begins to wash his feet and wipe his feet with her hair and her tears and anoints them with what? Ointment. Now, there are different ways that the story is explained in each of the Gospels. This is a powerful story because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record this story. This is one of those. 
that Jesus made sure appeared in every gospel. And in this gospel, it says that she anoints him with an ointment. In others, it identifies the box that that ointment is in, and it's called an alabaster box. For the longest time, I thought that the alabaster was the ointment inside. But the alabaster is actually the material that the box was made out of. Here is what it looks like in its raw form. This is what alabaster looks like. It's a white and it can be, depending on how finely or how well it's made, it can even appear to be translucent, like light will actually shine through it. So she got this alabaster box that today, if you were to take it from this raw state and put it into a box form, it would look something like this. So this was the box that she had that was filled with an ointment. And I like the fact that Luke 7 doesn't really deal with the ointment. It's like it doesn't give us a name because now you can plug in any person and you can plug in any precious thing into that box. And it was that precious thing that she puts on Jesus's feet. So now she does something nobody else has ever done at this point in Jesus's life. He's amazed. He's inspired. But guess what? Verse 39, when the Pharisees, which had bidden Jesus, obviously that would be Simon, he saw what she was doing. He spake within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she's a sinner. Now, this is powerful because how is he speaking? Is he speaking out loud or is he thinking in his head? The Bible says he said this in himself. He's thinking this to himself, but now verse 40, Jesus speaks out loud and he reveals the fact that he's a prophet because he's reading this guy's thoughts. And when Jesus answered, he says unto him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And what was Simon's response? Master, say on. Now, if you just stop here for a second, where are we? What, what event are we at? What, what, what kind of occasion are we at? We're at a at a feast. We're at a party. Jesus has been there long enough to be laying down. And at this point, Mary has moved in and she's doing what she's doing. Now, Simon is thinking what he's thinking while Mary is doing what he's doing, doing what she's doing. And then Jesus speaks up and he says, Simon, I got something to say to you. If you were Simon, you threw this party and your guest of honor is there. And they say, I have something to want to say to you. Everybody listen up. What do you think your guest is probably about to do or say. He's probably about to thank you for the party because the person you've thrown it for, the guest you've invited, he's there, he's happy. And he tells every oh, Simon, listen up, there's something I wanna say to you. He's probably about to say thank you. And it made me think about the story of Haman and with uh, the king. And when King Ahasuerus was unable to go to sleep, and in the book of Esther, when he's thinking, he's like, okay, I have to figure out what can I do to honor the man who saved my life? He calls Haman in and he asks Haman, what would you do for the person that you want to thank for saving their life or for doing some great thing? And when Haman gives the answer, what was Haman thinking? Who did Haman think was the man that he was going to honor? I thought he was going to honor him. But when Jesus is calling Simon up and when he's calling him out, he's not about to thank him. He's really about to do something better than thanking. He's about to teach him. He says, Simon, I want to take you to school now. I want to call you into my classroom and I want to show you something that you won't see if I don't show you. Sometimes the Lord has to call us out. And sometimes it's not really a matter of him calling us out. In actuality, what he's trying to do is call us up. What he's trying to do is call us in. And whenever he starts to teach a lesson, it's because he knows if I just outright tell him, he's probably going to reject it. If I just outright expose her, she's going to run away. So what Jesus will often do, more often than not, rather than tell us, he'll try to teach us. So he tries to teach Simon in a classroom, which happens to be in his own living room. So let's see if we can learn something from this. In Luke chapter seven, verse 41, Jesus teaches and says, there was a certain creditor 
which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he forgave them both. He frankly, meaning he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of these two will love him most? So I ask you all, like Simon was asked. And Simon was asked and he answered and said, I suppose that he to whom for he forgave most. And Jesus said to him, thou hast rightly judged. So like a good teacher with a good student, when the student gets the right answer, he commends them. He commends them. And it seems like it's obvious, but it's so obvious, but it's also so insightful because this is a story that actually cut against the very heart of what Simon thought was right. See, Simon didn't understand that when it comes to 50 pennies and when it comes to 500 pennies, both of these are symbols of debt. Both of these are symbols of deficit. These were debtors that owed their creditor something they couldn't repay. And when the creditor freely or frankly forgave them, they were both grateful. But Jesus asks, which one of these do you think is going to be more grateful? The one who owed more or the one who owed less? Simon says the one who owed more. But it wasn't just the fact that the person owed more. Look at what Jesus goes on to say in verse 44. Jesus turns now from Simon to the woman. And he says to Simon, so he's looking at this woman, but he's talking to Simon because he wants Simon to look at her, but not the way he was before. He says, see thou this woman? So you were looking at her, but now I need you to see her. Do you see her? I entered into your house and thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest to me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not, see, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Now, Simon is looking at this woman, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. And this is where Jesus teaches him because he says, I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she hath loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And Jesus said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. This is a story of two sinners and one savior. Who is the savior in the story? The savior is, no, who's the person saving? Yes, Jesus is the savior. But who are the sinners? And who else? And Simon. See, Simon thought there was only one sinner and one savior in this story. Now, he wasn't presumptuous enough to think that he was the savior, but he had not seen himself as a sinner. And the reason why we know that is because even though he was willing to give Jesus a party, he was not prepared to give Jesus his heart. See, he gave Jesus a party that that woman could never, or we should even say could never, or might never afford. Because if you actually look at the value of her ointment, the value of the spikenard or the perfume, it actually probably costs more than what it cost Simon to host this party. But it was not a party that she gave. It was her heart. But what kind of heart? Because when we think about your heart, people just think about, well, I'm just gonna give 100%. I'm gonna give all that I got. I'm gonna do the best that I can. No, 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 no. Because yeah, that's true. But in Mary's case, or in this woman's case, the best that he could give her were her sins. Because there's something you may not know about these two. When you read in verse number 49, it says, when they sat at meat, those that sat at meat with Jesus, they began to say to him within themselves, who is this that forgives sins also? 
And again, he says again to this woman, thy faith hath saved thee. You can leave this party. And instead of a party, I'm going to give you something better. I'm going to give you peace. Because we don't really see that from reading it in the scripture. But Mary and Simon and Jesus all knew each other. They all were familiar with each other. So let's go back. Looking at the story of the Pharisee that he's just called in Luke 7, Luke 7 calls him the Pharisee, but who is this Pharisee? Well, in Mark chapter 14, in the Mark account of the story, it describes who this Pharisee is. The man in Luke 7, in Mark 14, it says, being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as Jesus sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she broke the box and poured it on his head. Now, the man in this story is a leper, formally. Luke calls him a Pharisee. Mark calls him a leper. So it's the same person. Simon was a Pharisee that Jesus had healed from leprosy. This was the reason that he invited him to this feast, because he was thanking him for healing him of his leprosy. Now, rewind just for a moment. You may recall that last Sabbath, we studied a story from Luke chapter 17, and it was the story of Jesus healing how many lepers, Jael, you remember? He healed 10 lepers. But in this story, 10 were healed, but how many came back to say thank you? One. Only one. And that one came back, meaning that the other nine ran away. They were healed. They were happy, but they had not been made whole. Simon was healed of his leprosy. Simon was happy about it. He was so happy that he said, Jesus, to show you how grateful I am, I want you to come to my house and it's all on me. Bring your friends, bring the disciples, bring your whole crew. I want to thank you for healing me. So it would seem that Simon had the heart, not of the nine lepers, but of that one tenth. Yeah, it would seem that. But Mary shows he was happy, but he wasn't holy. He had been healed but he had not been made whole. He was changed, but he still was not saved because of his reaction and how he treated Mary. Look at what happens or what Desire of Ages speaks about how he was coming at her. Simon's coldness and neglect toward the Savior showed how little he appreciated the mercy he had received. The issue was not, was he healed? The issue was not, had he been saved? The issue was not, was he in the church? The issue was, did he value what Jesus had done for him? Because you can appreciate something, but not apprehend it. It goes on to say he had thought he honored Jesus by inviting him to his house. But now he saw himself as he really was. While he thought himself reading his guest, his guests have been reading him. He saw how true Christ's judgments were of him. His religion had been a robe of Phariseeism or Phariseeism. He had been despised or he had despised the compassion of Jesus. He had not recognized him as a representative of God. And while Mary was a sinner pardoned, he was a sinner unpardoned. This is unpardoned in the presence of salvation. The rigid rule of justice he had desired to enforce against her condemned him. Remember when Jesus says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Remember how Jesus says, forgive others because that's how I'm going to forgive you. This condemnatory and this judgmental aspect of how he treated Mary is exactly what limited him from accepting the grace that Jesus offered him. And what this is showing us is that one of the reasons why he had this party was because he thought that by having the party, maybe this might even out the ante, this might even out the debt. And so, you know, you gave me healing from leprosy, I'll give you this amazing feast and we'll be even. We'll call it square. 
He had a robe of a Pharisee. He didn't have the robe of righteousness. And this is where we got to do some real reflection. Yes, we can have a party with Jesus every Sabbath. Yes, we can have a party with Jesus and have worship every morning. Yes, we can have a party with Jesus and say, I'm his, I'm his. But what this story shows us is that the ultimate recognition that we have been saved is not a howdy heart, but a humble heart. And then when we appreciate the mercy of God, it will move us to not sit beside Jesus, but to even fall at his feet. Simon sat right by Jesus, but Mary sat at Jesus' feet. And what we're just simply trying to ask ourselves today is, are we satisfied, so self-sanctified that we're just sitting at Jesus' side? I'm in the place, I'm by his side. God is my co-pilot, but we've never taken the time to be at his feet because we really have not accepted full and frank forgiveness. See, when it comes to Mary and her attitude and her mind, who was the woman in the story? Remember, Luke 7 does not give us her name. So we go to another gospel to find that name. And that's John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, here is where we hear her name. In John chapter 12, beginning in verse one, all the way to three, it says, now Jesus was six days before the Passover came to Bethany. He's nearing the end of his road. And on the way to Jerusalem, he stops at Bethany. Bethany happens to be the hometown or the home base of his best friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. That was the hotel that he would stay in on his way to Jerusalem oftentimes. And the sermon of the Lord, even in other parts of our Desire of Ages, speaks to the fact that when he went to Bethany, that's where Jesus would kind of just would chill, relax, and let his hair down. He could be himself and not Jesus the teacher. He'd just be Jesus the friend because he was amongst friends. So he goes to Bethany and he stays over at Mary, Martha and Lazarus' house. But Simon, who happens to stay there, says, while you're there, you're going to lodge there. Let me give you some board. Let's have some food at my house. So verse two, there Simon, because Jesus was in town on his way to Passover, made him a supper. And that's why Martha was there serving as well, because it was her hometown. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Now, this is important, too, because Lazarus had just been raised up in John chapter 11. So this is a whole lot going on at this party. And here we meet the guests of Jesus's honor. Then took Mary. She took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and she anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of this ointment. So John 12 lets us know who the woman at this feast is, who does these great things. But it's not just any Mary, and it's not Mary, obviously his mother, and it's not Mary Magdalene, but it's Mary, the sister of Martha, the sister of Lazarus, who was just raised from the grave one chapter before. Now that we know who she is, let's look at who she was in her heart. When you go to the Desire of Ages, page 568, now we're looking at Mary, the sister of Lazarus. When to human eyes, her case appeared hopeless, Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw better traits of her character. The plan of redemption has invested humanity with great possibilities. And in Mary, these possibilities were to be realized. Through his grace, she became a partaker of the divine nature. Now, who was she? The one who had fallen and whose mind had been a habitation of demons was brought very near to the Savior in fellowship, and it was in even ministry. It was Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and learned of him. Remember that story where they had Jesus over for dinner one time and Martha's running around cookie 
cooking, but Mary is sitting down learning. That was that Mary. It was Mary, it says here, who poured upon his head the precious anointing oil and bathed his feet with her tears. The Mary that we're reading about now here in Luke 7 and in John 12. And it was this Mary, we learn, who will stand beside the cross in real time in Luke 7. But looking back, it was Mary who was actually there at the crucifixion of Jesus. It was Mary that followed him to the sepulcher when Joseph of Arimathea came and took his body and put it in the tomb. And there were women who left to go keep the Sabbath and then came back on Sunday morning. Mary, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, was first at the tomb after his resurrection. And it was Mary who first proclaimed a risen savior. Mary, Mary, Mary. This is that Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who in this story shows us how Jesus can take a demon-possessed woman and not just get the demons out, but by taking the demons out, she is filled, filled with the spirit of God to overflowing to the point that she does something for Jesus that nobody in three and a half years of ministry ever did for him. She bought a box of spikenard and anointed his feet, his head, and kissed her, kissed him with her own lips. Everything that you would usually do for somebody after they had died, after they had died, you would embalm the body. At the funeral, you would cry tears of grief for them. And if you love them that much and you miss them that much, you just might lean over into the casket and give them one more goodbye kiss. Everything that you would do for somebody that you love, but they had died and they had gone away, they had fallen asleep, even in Jesus, Mary does this for him at one of his last dinners on earth. The question that we've got to ask ourselves is what would move her to do something? What would give her such boldness, even though she was in the presence of the very person who got her into the life that got her demon possessed? Yes, it was Simon, the Pharisee, who actually got Mary into the life that led her away, that got her lost. But when Jesus found her, she's there celebrating this Jesus at the dinner in the house of the person, if you will, who turned her out. The person who got her off, who pimped her away. This is why you got to ask yourself this day, are you a Simon or are you a Mary? Both of them knew Jesus. Both of them had been healed. Mary of demon possession, Simon of leprosy, both of them actual and practical examples of being in sin. Both have been delivered. But we've got to understand they were all saved. Both saved, but only one of them loved Jesus. That's what we're really asking ourselves. I'm not asking you if you believe in the Lord. I'm not asking you to go to church. I'm not asking you, do you read your Bible? We're not asking ourselves, do we believe that Jesus is Lord? The question we're asking ourselves is, do we love him? When we love him and why we love him. I go to another quote in Desire of Ages, page 568. Jesus knows the circumstance of every soul. You may not know the answer to that question, but Jesus knows the answer to that question. If you're a Simon or if you're a Mary, and you may say, and if we're all honest, I'm sinful, very sinful. You may be. But the worse you are, the more you need Jesus. That's why Mary, she was 500 pence in debt. Simon was 50 pence in debt. But the creditor forgives them both. The Bible says, and the testimony testifies, he turns no weeping contrite one away. He does not tell to any all that he might reveal. But instead of revealing and exposing our mess, he bids every trembling soul take courage. 
Freely he will pardon all who come to him for forgiveness and restoration. In other words, Jesus says, I'm not going to expose your mess. Instead, if you come to me, I will accept your mess. I will take your mess and in return, freely forgive you. Mary had received this transaction. Mary had accepted it and we know she got it because when she got it, she gave thanks. She gave thanks for what? She gave thanks for Galatians chapter one, verse four. She believed even before it was written, Jesus who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our father. She believed that she had been delivered from the evil of this present world even while she was in the house of the man who got her into the evil that she was in. She was so caught up that she could do this in Simon's face because she could stand in, some, in front of Simon's face because she was at the feet of Jesus. And as long as she was there, nobody could touch her. Nobody could condemn her. Nobody could call her out because Jesus had called her in. She believed Romans chapter eight in verse 33. Who? Now you fill in the blank. That's a long line. Who? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justify it. It does not say that sin is good. It does not say that we are guiltless. The Bible says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect when it is God that justifies our sin? How does he do that? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. <laughs> These verses are powerful because they don't just say what Jesus is doing, but they say how God is thinking. It says that God justifies. Then in the next verse, it says that Christ died. So now together you have God sitting on his throne and then you have Jesus before him pleading as our high priest. They are both engaged, not in exposure, not in condemning, not in calling out, not even in complaining. What are they trying to do? Intercede for us. Mary knew what Jesus was going to do. Because at this point, Jesus had not gone to the cross. She had done and believed that Jesus was going to do everything that he had not yet done. And we know that because she literally treats his body as you would treat a cadaver or as you would treat a, a, a corpse. So you talk about believing in the life and the death and the resurrection. That's why she was the first one to declare his resurrection, because she believed that his blood was going to forgive. Not and even remember with Mary's case, Jesus hadn't even died yet. Mary just heard what Jesus said. And because of the relationship we, she had with him, she said, I believe I'm forgiven because I've seen the love that you've treated me in all the years that we've been friends. She believed Hebrews chapter seven, verse 25, where it says Jesus is able to save able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God. How are we going to go to God? How are we going to stand in the presence of a holy God? By him. Whoever comes to God, by Jesus, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. See, this is where I'm really having to, to believe this myself, where we've got to understand that when it says that God is for us, it means that God is for us. If he was really against us, if if you just, okay, all right, you want to go in that route and just say, God is just, you know, he's against, okay, if he was really against us, would any of us still be here? Yeah. No. When you think about everything that we read in Revelation, the seven last plagues that are to come, if the Lord was really all about just throwing out plagues, would he not be doing that right now? Exactly. He can't be all about that because he's not doing it now. He is literally deferring. He is giving us probation so that we can understand what he lives for. Do you read what it says in Hebrews? What he lives for is to make intercession. Look at it this way. If Jesus went to sleep and we know that he never sleeps, he never slumbers. He does not have to go to sleep. He's God. But humor, humor him for a second. If Jesus had to go to sleep, 
what would be the thing that would wake him up in the morning? Like what would get him up? <laughs> the sun. We get up normally because we got to do one of two things. One, either we have to go to work or we've got to go to school. We, we are compelled to get up. It was, it's what gets us going. It was gets us brushing fast, washing fast, driving fast to get to where we got to go. But if he doesn't work, and if he doesn't have to go to school, but if Jesus went to sleep, based on what Hebrews 7 is saying, if Jesus went to sleep, what would drive him to get up in the morning? To get him hurry up and brush his teeth, make him hurry up and wash his face, make him hurry up and dry, is to get in between you and God. He ever liveth. He would wake up and he'd say, I got to get to work. I got to get in between Chris and my father to make sure that they're close, to make sure that they're one. Go, go a step further. If Jesus went to sleep, what do you think Jesus would dream about? <laughs> there you go. Because it's what drives him. We dream about the things that we wish we had the power to do, like the power to fly or the power to swim in the water with our breath, or that we have all this money or all these great things. The thing that Jesus would be dreaming about is doing what he would be doing when he was awake, making sure you and God were one. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. So when we ask ourselves the question of who we are, the fact of the matter is we're all either Simon or Mary because we're all sinners just like they were. But we want to make the mistake, excuse me, we want to make the move that Mary made and not the mistake that Simon made. We want to walk in this love. How can we practically do that? This is powerful because when you think about God's gift to us and you think about Jesus giving us his life, it is exactly in parallel with what Mary gave to Jesus. What did she do? She took an alabaster box, broke open that spiked ointment, and it filled up the whole house. What happened when Jesus died on the cross and he paid for our sins? Ephesians 5, 2 says, walk in this love, walk in the atmosphere of love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. We're trying to understand what love is, right? We look at what Mary did because it's exactly what the father did. But in this instance, the father brought to our stinky house and to our stinky humanity, this precious box of alabaster. And this box was filled with this holy and this, this beautiful ointment the box that was broken is Jesus. And the one who bore and the one who did the actual breaking of the box was the father who broke Jesus so that the sweet smelling savor of salvation could fill this world, could fill our lives and make stinky sinners sweet, saved saints. This is what God does. Now, if this is what he does, we've got to do not the, not the saving, but we have got to do the smelling. How can I walk in this atmosphere? I can walk with Mary's mind where I'm just always aware and grateful of his mercy. And because of it, nobody around me can condemn me. Because of it, nobody can discourage me. Nothing can stop me. And because of it, my heart is just filled with a joy that drives me to actually tell people what he's done for me, because that's what she did. I was asking myself this question. I really want to know practically. Let me tell you what happened. I went to our bedroom and I was on our way, on my way to the restroom, our restroom. And I felt impressed to stop and to grab a book to read. And I grabbed this book off the shelf because I just randomly grabbed it because the lights were out. I grabbed this book. I grabbed this book and I grabbed the book and the book is called The Art of Bible Counseling. Let me just give you a little history on how we got the book. It was when we were living in Texas and it was a throwaway box of books that the church secretary had outside of her office. And I have just found that it just seems to be that the older a book is, the better that book is. 
the older the book is, it seems to be closer to the gospel message. Whereas the newer the book, the more colorful, the prettier, and the bigger the name on the front, usually the further it is from what the gospel is actually saying. This is just something I've just found to be true. And over time, it's proven to be true. I grabbed that one of those from the throwaway stack and I opened it up. I, I went into the light and I'm standing there and I just opened it up and I opened it up to the first page that I saw. And it was page 77 of this book on Bible counseling. Now, the, only, now, now the thing that's deep about this book is that not only was it a throwaway book, the book is actually, it's, I don't know if you can see it there, but it says factory imperfect. What it means is when the book was published, and this book actually was published by the Southern Publishing Association many years ago, the book wasn't right. Something was wrong with it physically. So it wasn't sold. It was defective. And they had to stamp it. It was marked imperfect. But from an imperfect, old, throwaway book, the Lord helped me understand how we can walk like Mary walked and walk in this love that Christ wills us to be. It was a story of this counselor, uh, Glenn Coons, the author. He's counseling this guy who's an alcoholic. And in his talking to him, he speaks uh, in reference to the session he has with his brother. Those troubled with guilt, guilt, Simon, Mary, those troubled with guilt might try audibly expressing their joy for God's forgiveness. Doing so, can be an effective form of therapy. Verbalizing an emotion will help to either reduce or intensify, depending on how the person approaches the emotion. Joy is intensified when frequently expressed. The distraught might try speaking his thankfulness to God in the following manner. Now, before we get to the following manner, we are not trying to be formulaic. We're not trying to say that you can make yourself happy. This is not a self-help therapy. What we're talking about is actually taking the word of God and making it as real and as a part of our life as Mary took a box of spikenard, broke it and poured it over Jesus's feet and changed the atmosphere around her. The spiritual principles in the Bible have practical manifestations. There are things that we do to show what we believe. There are ways that we live to show where our faith is lying. And what I've learned from this is that the way that we can show our faith is by verbally and by literally speaking the word of God, not to ourselves, but to testify what God has done for ourselves. Remember where it says up there, doing so can be an effective therapy because verbalizing an emotion will either reduce it or intensify it. Think of it this way. Let's say you're mad. Let's just say you're angry. We'll use a negative emotion. And when you say you're mad and you're mad, okay, you're angry. And then somebody comes to you and they say, what's wrong? And you're mad, right? You're angry. If you say, and you haven't said it to anybody, but you're just burned on the inside. If you say, I'm angry, the moment you say it, whether you know it or not, you've actually increased the level of anger that you're feeling because you've given voice to it. You have acknowledged it. You have stamped it. And you now you've let somebody else know, I'm not just angry. You need to know I'm angry. So now what happens? Now they know you're angry. So what are they going to do? They got to shift. They got to say, well, either, oh, what's wrong? Or they're going to be like, oh, let me stay out of your way because you're angry. I don't want you to bring that anger. What happens? You've shifted someone else just by what you said. Now that's in a negative. That's a negative emotion, true, real, honest. But now let's flip that. What if we went like Mary went and we didn't just think in our head, yeah, God loves me. Jesus loves me. She had to be sitting there at some point and say, I know God loves me. I know he forgives me. Now I'm going to put words on this. I'm going to put action on this. I'm, I'm going to express what I believe. So she didn't speak words of anger. She didn't just even speak words of praise. She went and she got a pound of ointment that would cost her about a year's salary to say, what could I do? I can't throw, I, Jesus already comes to my house all the time. He knows we're not rich. 
He knows we don't have a a, 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 a big old double burner stove and he knows we don't have a, a, a 12 foot deck or 20 foot deck. He knows we don't have a big swimming pool. He He's already been to my house. What more can I do for him? I know I'm going to go and I'm going to take something I would put on me back in the day to draw all kinds of people to me. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and take what I would have used and, and gotten for myself. I'm going to take that money. I'm going to get that ointment. I'm going to put it on his feet and in his hair. Friends, it says there, when we intensify, rather joy is intensified when we frequently express that joy. So how can we practically do that? And he gives a powerful, powerful way, which most of you probably already know this. But the question is, are you doing it? In other words, he's counseling this brother and he says how you can intensify your joy. Now you're going to take this verse and you're going to speak and say, thank you, Lord, that though my sins have been as scarlet, you have made them white as snow. Now, see, normally what we would say is, quote, Isaiah 118, which says, though your sins be as scarlet, they should be. But the problem and where we're going to the next level is we were saying Isaiah 118, just by quoting, we say, though your. So who's your? Your is anybody. Your is everybody who comes to Jesus. What we're learning now here is own it. Put your name. So he's counseling his brother to say, thank you, Lord, that though my sins have been as scarlet, you have made my sins as white as snow. Go to another verse like Psalm 103. Tar is actually in the process of memorizing this particular psalm. So there's one thing just to know what the psalm says, but when she was talking about how she's memorizing these verses, she's one of the ways that's helping her put it to memory is that she's embracing, she's understanding the meaning of the verse, which makes it easier to memorize the verse. She's owning the verse. She's personalizing it. So when you read Psalm 103 verse 12, we can say, thank you, Lord, that you have removed my transgressions from me as far as the east is from the west. Psalm 103 just says, I have it right here because we were there in Psalm 199. It says, Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far have he removed our transgressions from us. That's good, but that's like a burger without ketchup. That's like peanut butter without jelly. It's one thing to know that that's true, but it doesn't change, it doesn't save until it's true to you. Put some ketchup on that. Put the jelly, get the sweet to that peanut butter, so that now it's my transgression, my transgressions that he's separated from me as far as the East is from the West. That takes time. It takes time. It takes intentionality. But Mary took time. Mary was intentional. And in the midst of this big old party that Jesus was enthroned by this leper, ex-leper, he did not get the thanks that he thought he was going to get. Mary did because she took that Bible and she made it her own. You know, turning to Peter in the book, Arthur Kuhn, he turns to this brother. He says, it's helpful for people to think of God as where Jesus revealed him. God is a father who is far more merciful than we can possibly be. He is interested in our spiritual growth, in our obeying his every command for our own good. Please, please listen to this last part. He is not interested in how much we've caused him to suffer, but he is interested in how he may alleviate our suffering. This is our God. This is our God. The appeal and the hope is that we would see Jesus just like Mary saw Jesus. Yes, Simon saw Jesus. He literally was sitting in his house, but he didn't see him. He knew of him, but he really didn't know him. He was even healed by him. He had been touched by the power of God, but he was lost. And you knew he was lost because of his pride. The pride that he threw at Mary, the pride that he used to condemn Mary was the very pride that was keeping him from being saved like Mary. I want to pray and we want to pray 
that we recognize that from these broken boxes, God can make whole souls. One was Simon, one was Mary, and we can learn a lot from both of them. We didn't even get into what was going on with Judas, who was actually there at the party as well. But he's not in the Luke account, and that's why we didn't talk about him. Because really, it's all about asking us, are we Simon or are we Mary? And the easiest way to determine who we are is by how we respond to what Jesus has done for us. I want to respond like Mary did. And I want to pray now a prayer that all of us would experience the closeness that she had because she constantly focused on what he had done for her. She was not focusing on what she had done. She was not caught up in her past. She was caught up in her promise. And she never she saw her past, she saw, man, he took me from that. Wow, he took this from me. Wow. And that's what pushed her to, to that edge that she went over at that party that Simon had. And I just want to pray that this would be our experience too. So with that said, let's close out with this word. Thank you, Jesus, for the chance to be able to turn to you and to turn to you knowing that you're not looking at us with a fist. You're not frowning at us, even when you could, but you're smiling, not smiling at what we're doing when we're doing wrong. No, not at all. In fact, it is crushing you in your heart and sin is detestable to you. But you see sin in sinners. And you're able to, to, to somehow frown at that stuff, but then smile at us. Because as we read in the testimonies, you saw the possibilities in Mary. And you see the possibilities in each one of us. And I'm grateful today that you are still seeing us in that way. Because if you have not, and if you weren't looking at us like that, we would not be here right now. So now we want to make a shift and we want to make a turn. And we thank you for the story of Lazarus and the story of Simon and the story of Martha and this story of Mary to help us to realize who we want to be and who we don't want to be. And Jesus, we're asking you for forgiveness for our sins. We recognize that we've treated, um, we've treated you like Simon because we've treated other people like he treated Mary. And that's how we know whether or not we really are treating you like that. How are we treating the Marys around us? How are we treating the people around us who we think we're better than? How are we treating the people uh, who've sinned, who've done or made mistakes? That's an indicator of how we are treating you. And I know personally, I'm guilty of that. And I know that we all are guilty of that. But we also can be changed. We also can do what Mary did, and that's turned from herself, and that's turned to, to now to you. And we want to turn to you and pray that you not just forgive us, but now fill us. But I'm asking this in a specific way. I'm asking that you will fill our minds with a picture, with a panorama, with a portrait of your promise. And all those verses that we just read, from Galatians to Ephesians to Hebrews, that we now see ourselves in all of those verses when we've turned to you. Now they don't, we don't get the benefit of them if we run headlong into Babylon and run back into Egypt. We, we actually forfeit. But when we run to you, when we come to you, guilty, dirty, blamed, not blameless, blamed, we can hang on to these verses and not just hang on to them, we can put our names in them and go and sin no more. Put our names in them and rise up from our dead. Put our names in them and now we ourselves become a sweet smelling savior. We got a life and a testimony that actually draws people, not just to your side, but first to your feet too. I pray that we would do that. Whether or not we do that, only time will tell. But in the stillness of the moment, when we're by ourselves this week, whether it's late at night or early in the morning, when we're up or when we're down, when we're excited or even if we're angry, help us to put our names in these verses. Because of you, Jesus, when you look at us, that's where you put us. You put our names in those verses. You present us to the Father and you say, Dad, I died for him. Dad, I atone for him. And Father, you accept us in Jesus. You love us in Jesus. 
You bless us in Jesus. So I pray that we would answer this prayer by you reminding us and leading us to do this, not just now, not just this week, but until we see your face. Thank you, Lord, for all this love. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.